um, your role and some of your background in the hospitality industry. Sure. So I am being advertised as an outdoor hospitality person on the board. Um, and I didn't start that way, but um, I just actually retired from 30 years working in most of those were in the consulting arm. And most of those were in the outdoor hospitality industry where we would advise public sector clients like state parks and national parks and national forests and county parks and how to partner with the public sector for their hotels, restaurants, and recreation assets. And so I work with a company called CHM Government Services, and that's a consulting firm. And our clients were the National Park Service, the, the, the National Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, about 26 state park systems, various county park systems. And we would help them figure out how to either improve their hospitality operations that they were managing, or we would um, help them put together the deal structure between the public and the private sector. So probably the easiest way to understand this is who has been to a national park? You could raise your hand. Okay. Um, so about six, okay, who's been to a state park? State beach? Okay. Um, anybody been to a national forest? There's two sitting right behind you, those mountains. <laughs> those are those are pretty some pretty cool natural forests. Well, not as much on the natural forest, but in the state parks and in the uh, if you go to the state park. California State Parks, go to any of the beaches, you see uh, bike rental or cafes or things like that. Those are concessions. Those are private businesses operating in the parks under, under agreement with the state park system. Our firm put those deal, uh, would be helping put those together. If you go to Yosemite and you check into the, the lodge or you check in and you're going to camp there, Basically, those are managed by a company called Aramark. Aramark has a concession in the national parks, and our firm was responsible for structuring those deals. So any sort of hospitality or recreational asset class, whether it's a marina or a golf course or a hotel or a restaurant or a bowling alley or a shooting range or a motorcycle park, I basically learned about, I learned about the profit and loss statement and what it costs to build it, and that's how we would help organizations um, do their partnerships. So that's where I ended. And I just retired in uh, December 2022. But where I started, I think, is much more as important as, as for this discussion. So I grew up, I'm an alumni of this program. I graduated in 1986. And at that point, we didn't have this lovely campus up here. My degree is actually from the School of Business. Um, that's where the degrees came out of. And... I, got, I chose this program because of three reasons. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm hoping you think about this because I think there may be things like this in your life that will move you through your life as well. My parents always enjoyed entertaining. And I'm not talking about fancy entertaining. I'm just talking about family and friends. And so I was always kind of around the house, rolling the napkins and helping plate the food and stuff like that. Um, I also was a Girl Scout. And as Girl Scout, I got a chance to visit a bunch of different places that were beautiful. And I didn't think about it at that time. I just was a Girl Scout. And then finally, um, I liked to bake. And so I was like, oh, maybe I should go to culinary school. And my mom, wise mother, said, well, that would be a really good idea. And you could also consider a four-year degree program because if you decided you didn't like cooking, you would have a degree. So I applied. I applied here. I applied at University of Denver. I applied at Cornell, that wonderful school in the East, and I applied to UC Davis. And I didn't get into Cornell, which was my first like, oh my God, my life's gonna end. I don't have a career. I can't get into the school I want to get into. Um, but I got in here and I got in the other one. And I walked up to this campus up on the hill and I looked out and I said, this place is cool. I like this place. It was very, the setting of this campus is so beautiful and it really sold me on, on it. So um, while I was here in college, you know, your work experience, I basically created my own internships at a hotel that would break down the bed for me. And so when I was coming out of Cal Poly, I thought about, um, I was, we didn't have these, uh, I guess, sectors or segments of interest, it was more general. So I wanted, thought I wanted to be a hotel general manager. So at that point, um, there was some folks recruiting on campus and I ended up going with Hyatt in the equivalent of, I guess, similar to the Voyage program, where I was, uh, um, 
I had a year long training program and then you choose what uh, emphasis you want on the way out. So I, at that point, I grew up in California, but I said, you know, I want to, I want to be somewhere else as I start my career. Okay. And, and I encourage you to be thinking about that because, it, because that first point in your career is really where you get a chance to rediscover yourself again. And if you're thinking about any of these major, if you're thinking on the lodging side, any of these major hotel chains have hotels in this state, they have hotels in other states, and your leverage is greatest when you come out of college. So that's a really cool time to think about like moving your body to another place if you wanted to do it. So I said, I need to move my body to a different place and I ended up in Washington, DC. And I wanted Washington, DC because I liked the fact that it was like kind of an international city, but kind of manageable at the same time. So I, my first job was with a Hyatt up in Bethesda, Maryland. And uh, I had a mansion training program. It was a hotel that was opening. So I was like, oh, I had either an established hotel chance or something that was opening. So that's another piece of advice is you're trying to figure out those first jobs if you get to choose which hotel you want to be in or where you want to be in, think about why you want that property. You know, is it because it's where it's located? Is it because it's close to your home? Is it because the clientele that was there? One of the reasons I chose Hyatt was because I liked its clientele. It was like a corporate hotel. And I said to myself, do I want to be dealing with people who kind of travel as part of their life? Or do I want be at a hotel where travel is something like special, like at a resort or whatever. Those are those are things you should be thinking about because you as a person know who you want to be dealing with. And, and this is a chance, or maybe you've never dealt with a certain audience, but you want to deal with that sort of audience. So anyways, work with Hyatt for a year. Um, and in that program, you went through every department. I was a bellman, I was a night auditor, I was a housekeeper, I was a banquet server. Um, and so I finished that program and I, and then I stayed at that hotel and I was the assistant banquet manager. I did that for a year. And then I still thought I wanted to be in the hotel business. And while I was at that hotel, I remember sitting in a, I was rotating through the food and beverage department and we had a, the GM, the food and beverage director at that time said, why don't you come and sit in the food and beverage management meeting? We started talking about the profit and loss statement about, and the budget and the forecast. I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. I, I, this is, I hadn't even really focused on that stuff before. Um, so that was like, I stored that in my brain. And then after I left that property, I went up to Baltimore and I was convention services manager. And I was the assistant at the bank manager, but I, I was the head convention service manager um, in the major convention center hotel. <clears throat> and I was like managing people who were like twice my age and it relatively, freaked me out. It was a really hard thing to do. And quite frankly, you could find yourself and will find yourself managing people who are twice your age. So that's something, it's, it's all okay. No one's gonna put you in that position if they don't think you can do it. But it was kind of a like, oh crap, like I, there's, I haven't even lived some of these people's lives and I'm telling them that they need to do this part of the life this way, you know, this part of the job. So anyways, it was a very challenging position in, um, I had uh, I had to fire my assistant manager. That was my first firing, my job. And I that was a learning experience, not something you want to do at the age, right old age of 24, you know? The good news is that my assistant manager wasn't, you know, 40 and I wasn't changing his life, but I was changing the trajectory of this person's life in some ways. So that was a really, top experience mm -hmm. and basically I was working a lot and I had a roommate who said to me you know Margaret have you ever like divided your hours of work by your salary and figured out what your hourly, hourly wage was and at that point in Maryland the average minimum wage was not 1575 like in here in California it was a lot lower and so I said you know maybe 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 this aspiration for a general manager is not what I want to do. Maybe I need to think differently. So that I, by that point, I had spent four years of my education and three years in um, you know operations, which is kind of a good amount of time to kind of get a sense of whether you like it or not. Um, so I answered a one ad, 
in the newspaper, which tells you how old I am, and uh, got an interview for PKF Consulting. Obviously, you guys know Bruce Walton. Um, it was not with him, but it was for an office uh, in Virginia. And and I went in for the interview, and he, and you know they had my resume and everything. And I said, they said, so where did you go to school? And I was like, well, I went to Cal Poly Pomona. And I was like, like what? I was like, well, yeah, you know, the largest hospitality school in California. And, you know, it's, it's four years. This guy was from Michigan State. So, of course, his world existed in the US. <laughs> but I guess what I'm saying is, is that I had no doubt that this program and this degree gave me what I needed. But sometimes once you move out of your network, if, if, if you're working outside of California, people may not know that. So, you need to take pride in the program and your training and your professors and everything else. And I also, for some God knows reason, I didn't think anybody else was interviewing for the position, which is also an interesting idea. Just assume it's yours when you go in the door. It's amazing how it changes the way you think about the opportunity. So I started in the consulting world. Um, and again, I couldn't have chosen this, but the person who was in charge of the office used to be a concessioner in a national park. What are the odds, okay? So his clients were state parks. And so early on in my career, I had a chance to be exposed to doing consulting for state parks or consulting for should I build a hotel on the side of the interstate or at an airport. And so I was doing this assignment here and doing this assignment here. And I was like, I kind of like this stuff over here. I like the people. I like the places I'm going. I like I like the problems I'm trying to solve. And so really, at that point, I kind of began to understand that the public sector solution for problems was one that I enjoyed dealing with more. Um, one of the big things that we found when we were hiring people with our firm is somewhat generationally, you folks are mission driven. Well, why am I doing this? What is the greater purpose that I'm trying to serve with this job that I have? And, and the purpose could be to put a roof over my head, and that's a very legitimate, to, to make sure that I'm financially secure and I have a place to live. And beyond that, why do I want to do this? And I found that um, the public sector work was very, w w included those elements. So I felt very moved by it. So basically, from then on, for the next, I guess, 27 years, I went through four different consulting firms, um, PKF, and then Landauer, and then PricewaterhouseCoopers, and then CHM Government Services. Um, but all of that was focused on dealing with public sector clients. So the good news about dealing with public sector clients in the outdoor hospitality industry is that their problems are located in beautiful places. Um, the bad news, or not the bad news, the challenging news in dealing with people in the outdoor hospitality industry in the public sector is they don't understand the outdoor hospitality industry. So you spend a lot of your time explaining elements of a profit and loss statement. You explain to them the unique characteristics of how it needs to operate. In, in the public sector, you have, to, you have to run everything by rules and regulations and statutes and regulations. So you have to learn all that too. So it was a whole new world that I learned. So anyways, that's a long way to answer a very simple question, but I would say that I I would never, I would never not spend, have spent those three years in operation because every time I went in and did my consulting engagements, I hit street cred. Nobody could like pull the wool over my eyes in regards to what it took to run or set up a banquet or change a room or be the night auditor. It always gave me a better opportunity to interact and actually a lot of consulting is getting information out of people. And if you don't understand the job of the person that you're talking to, you can't tell if they're giving you kind of the wrong story about what the situation is. So I would never discourage a student from spending time in operations because it it, it is it, it it really does provide a foundation not only for gaining confidence in that you understand the business, but also that you can rely on it in another way as you move through your career. So, so anyway, so where I am right now is retired, and um, I am now back here trying to help get more students in and more students out. So anyway, 
Um, what I do want to talk about just briefly before we go on is um, I'm working to get employment opportunities in the outdoor hospitality industry. There's a internship at Bonanelli Park, which is an RV resort right over the more, uh, over the mountain. Uh, that there's some flyers up. Nobody's applied for it, so I'm kind of looking like an idiot right now because I went and tried to find it, hoping there'd be someone who wants to do it. So if anybody has any questions about that internship, it's a summer internship. The GM of that property has worked in the hotel business, and the company that is behind that uh, management company is the largest public sector campground operator in the United States. So if any of you are like, we're like, I don't understand what this is. I don't know what a part of an RV resort. It's a pretty cool place. It's nearby. So I'll talk to you about that. Um, there's a couple other uh, handshake um, uh, internships with Airmark and their sustainability sector, one of which happens in a national park. The other one happened uh, remotely. And that one is also a summer one. And I can talk to you about that. Uh, there are Daniel... Villa, 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 whatever, Daniel Lobo. Yeah, yeah, Daniel uh, spent some time working with me on um, opportunities with Airmark and uh, DSI. So if any of you are interested in employment or with private companies in national parks or state parks, come talk to me. And I'll just say one more thing, and I promise I'll be quiet and answer the next question. When we, I, there is one thing I do regret. If I would have known now about Airmark and GSI, when I was at Cal Poly, I would have worked in a different national park every summer. I would have done that. Because what happens when you go, most of these concessioners have housing in the parks. I'm not saying it's glamorous, it's like a bunkhouse. They have housing, they have food, you have to pay a small stipend for that. You're working with people from all over the country and all over the world, and the people you're serving are from all over the world. And that's not to say you can't find all of that in California. But kind of like if you can drive in your car and go work somewhere and like maybe the most beautiful place, some of the beautiful places, I would I would have done that. So anyway, I can talk to you about that. And I'm super encouraging of that because I think expanding your horizons geographically is also a good thing to do. So did I answer your question? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So our second question is uh, what were some key points in your career that led you are? to where you are today yeah i i um i think there's the i kind of talked a little bit about them but i'm going to kind of flip that question a little bit when i was i did a guest lecture in um uh the finance class uh, don say dr pillar and i asked a question of everybody in the class and i said if you were going to give yourself a grade right now for how much you trust yourself and like yourself, what would it be? And if it's a D, because you're not really happy with yourself, I would say the most important thing you need to do for the next period of time before you graduate is work on yourself, okay? If you gave, I think I came out of Cal Poly with like a B, B plus. I thought it was pretty hot shit. I like myself, <laughs> I trusted myself. And the reason that is exceptionally important is because every time you're going to have to make a career decision, you're going to have to look inside yourself. And if you don't trust yourself and value yourself, you may not make a decision that's going to get you to a good place. And I think every time I was asked to make a pivot, like, do I want to go in the public sector or do I want to go in the private sector? I said, you know, I, I kind of I like I like how I feel when I deal with these public sector people. I had up when we when I had to leave Price Waterhouse Coopers. So like, do I want to stay at Price Waterhouse Coopers or do I want to go to this other consulting firm? I'm like, you know, I'm more excited about this one, and I think I'm going to feel more comfortable over there. You know, so it's just, you know, I would say when I had to fire somebody was not a really great experience, but. Interestingly enough, the other thing I talked about uh, in that finance class is what, what do you need in your life to keep you sane? You need family, friends, and network. I remember I had maintained a really good re uh, relationship with my high school teacher, and she talked about how, how when she sees students and she talks to them, how discipline and failure is actually part of the growth process. 
And if I didn't have that person to talk to and process what firing that person may mean and what that could mean for that person in another way, I would have not had some of the resources I needed. So I think the pivots were, the pivot was from operations to consulting. And then the pivot was from one consultant firm to another. And then another, uh, here's two other points. And these are really good questions because I kind of have to think about my career. When I was working with PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, I wanted to, uh, I, I read a whole bunch about parks and, and really our firm's involvement in the national parks and the national forest came because I was curious enough and brave enough to pick up the phone and go meet with people. So that's the other thing that in your career, you're gonna find there's moments where you're uncomfortable. But I would say nine times out of 10, if you're not gonna be hurt by it, step into uncomfortableness. Because usually on the other side, something else is gonna happen that's 99% of the time positive. So um, I think, yeah, that's, I don't know. It's kind of an answer to the question, but hopefully it will give you, I think it's the most important part of that question, which is when you're asked to pivot, what is it that you relied on inside of you to make you comfortable doing it? And a big part of that is you being comfortable with you. So that mentorship is what really also helped you. Yeah, in that case with the firing person, that was huge. But but I just, having confidence in yourself is super important. And if you're not there yet, find yourself, surround yourself with people who help give you confidence. Um, and, and, and challenge yourself in situations to gain it. That's probably it. So we have some questions from our students and <coughs> some students are very interested in consulting. Okay, so um, one of the questions is, how do I prepare before getting into consulting? And how would you give advice for somebody who is starting? What is it you need to do exactly? Okay, so I think I answered part of that and if you think you're going to be a consultant and have never worked in operations, I encourage you to spend some time in operations. Um, I will say that the classes I did worse than here at Cal Poly were my finance classes. And yet, I mean, like, I got a C. That's the only C I got. Um, but I ended up using it later. So don't get discouraged if you, like, something doesn't work here. But figure out if you like it in general. So anyway, spending time in operations is critical. The other thing is if you are not really good with Excel, I'd encourage you to get really good with Excel really soon. If you're doing anything outside of operations and you don't have what I would call beyond an uh, advanced, uh, intermediate level of Excel, you need to do it. And, and, and because that's, that, is the, that is the software of consulting. There's many other software platforms and I'm sure AI will change something about that. But ultimately, consulting is about gathering data, putting it somewhere, assembling it, and interpreting it. And you need Excel. And um, and then I would say spend some time talking to the board of advisors, people who are in consulting. You know, I mean, there are more jobs in operations than there is consulting. You know, that's that's just the truth. Um, so it's, a, I think it's a little more competitive, um, but you know, if, if the, the classes that there's parts of consulting that are also part of operations, I mean, if you're interested in revenue management and you become really good at revenue management, that could be useful in consulting. So, um, if you're really interested in accounting, um, and, or food and beverage cost control, those are elements that could be ending up in consulting. So it's not just operations to consulting, uh, knowing how to read a balance sheet and knowing how to read an income statement and knowing the uniform system of accounts for the lodging industry, which you probably need to do in your finance class anyways, um, is super important. Um, and then network, 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 you know, who's in consulting and, you know, my firm was like eight people. Most consulting firms are small, so that's the other piece of it that, you know, it's not like, you know, a thousand openings. Um, so anyways, that's, yeah. that's, no, that's great. Yeah. So that's why we're here today. So, <laughs> um, so obviously for your experience in operations and consulting, I'm sure you've been through a lot of interviews. 
Um, what is something that you do to make yourself stand out in an interview? Well, the first thing I do is I'm assuming that I'm going to get that interview, okay? And the way you get the interview is to make sure that your top line of your resume is relevant to the company you're applying to. <laughs> be amazing how many of those subject lines don't get changed if I'm applying for lodging front desk positions saying I want a career in the food and beverage industry. Not a good idea. A compelling cover letter with AI, those things are getting read by a computer, okay? And, you know, there's a method to a cover letter, but if you don't take the time to A, pull the computer, like make sure you have the right job opening number on the top and the right name, and create a compelling reason to get past the first line, I'm super excited about this position because of X. And if you don't take the time to look at the job description and somewhere in your cover letter say, you know, my skills in uh, front desk management have been, you know, you know, customer service has been enhanced by my front desk management at YZ. So what I'm saying is, is that you can network yourself into an interview, but if you're not there, you got to get those first things done correctly. In the interview, you should not be going into an interview if you haven't spent some time on the company's web page looking at the purpose the mission, the goals of the organization. If it's a small company, you better be looking at who their people are and where they went to school and what are their passions and what are their other stuff. Because you know what? At the end of the day, you're typically in the interview because you've checked the box of the stuff that you need, okay? So then it's a matter of how do they remember you versus somebody else? And ultimately an interview is a conversation. So the more you know about the people you're talking about, the more comfortable you're going to be having the conversation. And then, you know, you got to make sure your hair is brushed and your teeth are brushed and your clothes are straight and ironed and stuff like that. But, you know, in my industry, people show up in my, not consulting, but in the parks, people show up in, you know, jeans and everything else. But, um, and you can't fake passion, okay? Passion matters, you know? Um, so anyways, those would be, those would be kind of some of the basic. Do your homework. It's like anything else. It's it's an assignment to get a job. Make sure you understand what you're applying for. And and oh by the way, if you if you can use your LinkedIn networks to find out somebody else who knows something about that company, go talk to them. Because the last thing you want to do is get into a company that you think is a great company, and they treat employees like. Mm -hmm. So find out about the company from the people who work there. You know, yeah, there's glass door and all that other stuff, but I'm saying people, people conversations matter. Uh, another question that we have from a student, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier about uh, leveraging your education here at Cal Poly Um What what kind of ideal? Uh, what kind of job position is like ideal for someone who's coming outside, um, graduating from Cal Poly? You guys can do anything. If you come out of this college with a four-year degree and a GPA that is, you know, not 1.9, maybe like 2.5, you know, to, you know, whatever. I mean, there's people who come out of this program with like a, probably a C average and have been widely successful. So this program provides you great opportunities. The work experience is absolutely essential. To me, the reason like I'm here is because I'm trying to say, look, there's a whole other sector of the world out there that you could work in that you may not know about. I mean, there's multiple sectors within this sector. You could literally go to the state of Arkansas and be a general manager and the regional director of four lodges that the state of Arkansas runs. Did you even think about that? You know? So, I mean, this industry is so broad. If, if anything, I would encourage you to step outside of the the what I would call the traditional lanes and, and experiment over if you're coming in the door and you're not spending every summer trying to do something different to experiment, you're not doing yourself a favor because you may be missing something that you could become super passionate about. So there's this program is solid. This program, when somebody hires a student from this program, they are getting someone who is work ready. Okay. They shouldn't be concerned about you. The, the barriers are entry. They're like, you're ready. You are ready to work. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody has any more questions, please feel free to raise your hand or bring it up. But um, one of the other question I wanted to ask you was, what does your day-to-day -day look like and how does it compare to what you used to do on day? Okay, so I saw that crept on my video, so like six months ago or right now. So um, when in the consulting world, um, and I was like, I had kind of like, well, I had three jobs. Because it was a small firm, there was our managing director and I was a senior vice president. I was kind of like the, he was like the CEO and I was the COO. So I was the one who was like trying to keep the train on the tracks and the people happy and like training happening and so forth. So, you know, that's like making sure that we have systems in place to move the firm together, make sure that our resources are what we need to do our consulting job. Um, and then I had, I had selling responsibilities. So I had to constantly be thinking about where are the clients, where can we find some clients? So I was, you know, reading like, you know, I had a Google news feed for state parks and national parks. I would uh, be networking with other professionals in the field. I'd be going to conferences. So that was a big part of it. So I'd be writing proposals, like you need to hire us because um, I'd be doing budgets for those proposals. And then I have to do the work. I'd have to do the actual engagement. I'd have to, you know, create a, uh, we did a, our firm did this major strategic operating assessment for all of Arkansas's lodges. They have four beautiful lodges located all over the state. And we'd never done one of those before, or we kind of had done parts of it, but not all of it. So I had to like create the whole template for how we're going to do the report. So I guess my point is, is it, no days were the same, but they were the same types of things that I would have to do. And then we'd have to like make sure that we had a new employee, we were training them how to do what we did. So a little bit of everything. And then tra if we had an engagement, traveling to the site and doing the field work as well, which was always the funnest part because you can say I have no problem talking and I get to talk to people, so. Thank you. Uh, another question from the student is, uh, what is an expected salary for what you do? Um, well, I have three young adults and, um, uh, they're they were they're doing pretty well in today's market, but I I my let's just put it this way I started with Hyatt at the grand whopping salary of sixteen thousand eight hundred. Okay, then I think I ended Hyatt maybe at I don't even know I think my first consulting I probably had a salary of forty five thousand to seventy five thousand for the majority of my career. And then at the end part of my career, I would have a salary that uh, there was a base of, let's say, 100, 150, and then I had to sell the rest of it. And in consulting, sometimes it gets to that. It's, it's you basically, part of your salary is tied to what you can bring in. So depending upon what consulting firm you work with, at Pricewaterhouse Coopers, that was not the case. We were part of the hospitality consulting arm. But on smaller boutique firms, you basically get paid by what you bring in. So consulting, if you think about consulting, there's the ones who do the knee-deep analysis and never pull their heads up, and that's super important. And then there's the ones who can go take that stuff and sell it to somebody. And if you can be kind of good in this and good in that, you will go further in consulting. So, you know, it's, and again, it, it really depends upon, is it a corporate firm, a small firm, and what the market conditions are. Thank you. Uh, another question from us is, how do you keep yourself organized with so much on your plate uh, in your day-to-day? -day? Yeah, if, if it's not in my Outlook or Google Calendar, it doesn't, it, it, it kind of loses track of things. So I, I really, it's really use my Outlook Calendar. I, I am still an old person and I write things down. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just, I write oh. lists and I write lists and I reorganize lists and I check things off and then I put things in my um, my calendar. Yeah. And that's everything from like what I do in, in the day as well as my personal life as well. So. Oh, and then I will say just on that note, I have learned that if I don't take care of myself, I don't exercise, I don't have time for myself. I'm just really not productive for anybody. And I think it's super important that you make your health and wellness an important part of your life plan. 
because you know I'm like 60 years old and I still think I'm like 23, whatever. <laughs> so I mean, it's it's everything. It's, it's nutrition, it's sleep, it's wellness, and this is a very high powered industry. So you need that opportunity to kind of reset, you know, you you know your your internal energy level, because it's also a very giving industry. You know, I'm helping, I'm serving you, I'm taking care of you. So it takes a lot out of you as well. So it's really important that you spend time putting stuff back in that schedule of time. Thank you. Um, so another question from a student. Um, you mentioned that we can try any kind of job, but what precisely um, kind of job do you think is best based on qualification after graduation? So essentially the question is asking, how do you, um, dive deep into the hospitality industry right after graduation. So I was thinking maybe you could talk about your experience with the Hyatt Manager Training Program. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to go backwards. I always answer the question, but I go back before I answer it. The reason there are 800 hours of work experience required in this major, and in most of the hospitality majors, is for you to figure out what you want to do and also expose yourself to different employers, large employers, small employers. Lodging employers, club employers, zoos, <laughs> or, or whatever. And so my point is, it doesn't make a lot of sense to come out of college and choose something that you don't kind of sort of feel like you understand and you get some experience in, okay? It's gonna be hard to get a job that way. But you know, it, it is not unreasonable to be, uh, uh, to to I, there's not there's not there are so many companies that have management training programs okay there's not a lot I mean there's some but there's not if you need this sort of structure then then go for that if you're not sure go for that um, but you know if you're passionate about the lodging industry and you've worked at four hotels as a front desk clerk you are totally capable of being a front desk supervisor or front desk manager you know what I'm saying um, if you've been uh, uh, have five different positions in a kitchen, there's no reason why you can't be a, a, a supervisor or a manager in a kitchen. Um, you know, depending upon the size of a restaurant, you could be a restaurant manager, but you may have to be an assistant restaurant manager first. Um, you know, um, and it, 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 it's like, what, what sector of the industry are we talking about? You know, in the club industry, you could, you could end up being a membership coordinator for a year, and then uh, end up over in like the rest, the assistant restaurant manager. But you are ready for management and supervisory positions. And the only reason I say supervisory versus management is because depending upon the scope and scale of the operation you would be responsible for, you may not be there yet. But but you should not be applying for a position as a supervisor if you can't see that there's a manager position right there. So that in six months when you've proven yourself, you know how to do it. You're the one that they're going to look at. So, uh, so you know, it's just there's so many things you can do that that. When, but I think the key issue is you are ready for a supervisor or management position in anything that you you do. And and if you're not thinking you are, come talk to me, okay? Because that means that you don't have the confidence in your capabilities that you need to be going out into the world and using the skills that you've been given. Thank you. Um, we're going to ask for any last minute questions from the audience. One. Two, uh, one. Do I, I think I can project. <laughs> I have I, 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 It's going to go all the way. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for coming on. I know you have a schedule. And oh, no, I'm retired. It. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's my pleasure, is what I say. So, obviously, we're going to make more like, you know, the, uh, a completely different assignment, I would think, than like a pretty consulting firm. So I wonder if you could like run through like like a day in your life um, when you were at PwC. Sure. Um, so the reason we got into PwC is we were with another firm and PwC kind of bought our firm in. Okay. So I didn't apply cold turkey into consulting with PricewaterhouseCoopers. Mm -hmm. um, the other reason PwC wanted us is because we were working in the public sector and they wanted a public sector practice. Um, so. At that time, I would say we had two clients, two sets of clients. We had the Department of Defense, which is a whole other sector that I could talk about, um, and the, um, the National Parks. So um, 
for both of those clients, we were doing market feasibility studies. Should you or should you not build it? Financial feasibility studies. What does the profit and loss statement look like if we build it? And then investment analysis. What sort of return on, on investments would you get? So it would be, um, so whether we were doing that for a golf club on a military base or a aero club on, at the Air Force Academy, um, it was focused on, you know, the, the typical day was if we were at the beginning of the project, we'd be preparing for field work, which means setting up your agenda, getting your interview set up, getting your supplies, doing your research, and then going to the location and gathering data. Um, then you'd come back and, and then most of your time would be spent aggregating the data, putting into a model or something like that. And then you would um, have to then write a study from what you've done. So right there are three completely, di three completely different skill sets. Knowing how to talk to people to extract information. Because in consulting, you're only as good as the information you get out of somebody else. If you can't get information out of somebody, you can't consult. Which means you have to have people skills. The second one is knowing how to aggregate and, and, and use data, which is usually Excel. And then the third one is you got to be able to write. you got to be able to interpret data. So that would be kind of, and literally, it was depending upon where we were in the process, that's where we would be. Okay. Any other questions before we split up? Um, you mentioned like earlier about being in the operation before being um, a consultant. Um, when you say operation, do you mean like the entry level or like just entry level? Um, I think I think in a perfect world, supervisory or management experience, because what ends up happening is if you're in a staff position, you don't. I, you get a perspective of it. As a manager, you have to be understanding everything because as a manager, you're probably accountable for sales volume, cost control, uh, uh, marketing. And when you think about consulting, usually those are things that end up in that bucket that you're consulting on. So if you kind of haven't looked at it and had to do it, you know, you're not really, your, your, your bench strength isn't as deep. Hello. Thank you again, by the way, for um, doing the lecture. It's always been going class as well, too, last month as well. Yes. Um, I think a lot of us are in the experience where, like, the hospitality industry has so much to offer, and we really want to do a little bit of everything. How much experience do you think each person should take in each sector before jumping into a new career? Yeah, that, that's, that, that's, I think that's, it's a good question. And I think that, um, I, I have a weird perspective on it because somehow I knew that I wasn't sure what I knew, to, knew, knew how to do. So when I set up those mini internships every summer at the same hotel, it was like, oh, I should probably learn about catering. Oh, I should probably learn about that. So I think I was wired because I'm curious to, to kind of like do that. But I, I think that there is enough diversity in this industry that if you think about the four, three summers that you have before you graduate, I'm super, if you go two ways, you either go super deep and get really, really good at something because you're super passionate about it and you want to come out and just hit the ground running. Or if you're not, use those summers to experiment, you know, and find out what you don't want to do. Because half of this is like, I certainly don't want to do that job. You know what I'm saying? But sometimes you don't know it until you do it. So, um, and then I think that um, what's interesting about our board, and you know, it's on the webpage, you can read what everybody does, it's they're from all over the place. They have all different sectors. And, and I'm just like a microcosm of 40 of those people. Those people want to interact with the students, okay? Jake is working with us on making sure that the way that we interact is, is efficient. But if, you know, if you're really, if you, if maybe you want to go into food procurement, well, we got to guy or gal who's with Cisco, you know, if, if you really want to be back at a house working on equipment in, in food and beverage, we got a guy with Ecolab who's like servicing that equipment and sanitation. You know, we've got, there's, and quite frankly, if there's industries that you think are not being exposed to here on the campus that you're interested, you need to be talking to us 
and say what, because we could get those people on the board. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I, I think my point is experimentation. The risk of experimentation when you are below the age of 25 is so low that I encourage you to do it because every, every, as you get older, you just get, you know, I don't know, either fiscally more conservative or like just personally more conservative, or whatever. <laughs> My point is, this is the time to do it, you know? And like I said, I very, I do not talk about regret because I can't change it. But as I was telling you, it would have been really darn cool to like be hanging out in national parks versus the hotel down the hill from my house. You know, <laughs> if I was going to clean a bedroom, I could have cleaned a bedroom, could have cleaned a tent in Yosemite, and I didn't know about it. So. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If uh oh, oh. Yeah, I just want to like ask. Um, so I know that you kind of have been doing a lot with like the community board stuff and stuff like that. I was wondering how do you like are you able to make the work like balance? So I know that you mentioned things like the healthy life balance stuff like that, but how do we get to that point? Because right now I'm like in school working as well and I barely feel like I have enough time to make balance. No, that's that's a very fair question. I <laughs> I would say that my husband says I would probably say that I did not have an exceptionally kind of work life balance. I probably had a work balance versus a life balance. So um, I, uh, I, 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 I think that there are the things you have to do in your life. Um, you have to make enough money to live. You have to make enough money to take care of your school and your family. Um, and ideally, if you can, in doing that, find something that you enjoy, then it's not as much work, it's more passion. So I think there's things that happen in work that are give you negative pulls on your energy level, and there's ones that give you positive things. So I'd really encourage you to try to be finding work that when you're there, you know, you're not super stressed. You're, you're in a good place, and that's a good indicator. You go to work every day, you come back. There's a difference between coming back from work exhausted because it's hard work and being coming back from work where you're emotionally drained because it takes something out of you. So think about that as you choose your jobs. And then, um, you know, and then take care of yourself. I mean, there, there is no, it's a, it's a fallacy, okay? There is no balance. There are moments of tranquility and there are moments of chaos. It just, it doesn't work. I remember I was, Water Cooper's like, how do you like be a mom, a working mom? She's like, you're a working mom and your life's gonna suck. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I always I knew that if I, you know, worked out four days a week or something, you know, or or whatever, I would feel better. It's like I, it's the cup thing, you know. If, if you if you if you fill your cup and you don't get to drain it, you can't fill it up anymore. And the exercise would be like dumping the cup out for me. So, um, but realize that there are points in your life where there's just a lot. And, but, but if you can't ultimately take care of you, you can't keep going. So you gotta, you gotta take care. Maybe not the answer. I, if you're looking for a silver bullet, I do not have it. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Yeah. One more formal question. Remember, I will be here for any informal questions. Going back to how you said, if you emotionally are drained from a job and you don't like it anymore, no how would you uh, explain if you choose a job that you like the position and and what you do, but you didn't like how it like emotionally drained you? I mean, you wanted to leave the company. How do you leave with like not? Nah, if you were there for a short time, how do you leave? And then go explain to your other uh, potential employer that you left because you liked what you did, but I did it, it wasn't right for you, but you'll be better at their Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think that um, currently, 
this industry is strong enough that they need capable people in so many places. Okay. So there's always the risk of if I lose this, is is that is that situation gonna put me, is it, am I gonna lose something and not get something? Okay. So I think I feel right now that the industry is pretty good. Um if um if you've only that there is a situation where maybe part of what your emotional is feeling, and I don't know this, and we can talk offline about this, is could be just where you're at with that, what you know about that job and how you work in that job. So sometimes there's early learning stress that goes away as you get through it. But if you know this job and you know how to do it and you're still feeling emotionally stressed because of the people and how they treat you or how they operate, um, uh, uh, you, and you know you're good at what you do, it's not gonna be a matter of explaining. It's, it's a very, what you basically say, look, I was in this environment, it was not a healthy environment for me. I know how to do my job, I'm very good at it, but in this particular environment, it was not healthy for me. I, mean, I think we're getting to the point in some of our industries where work environment is, is recognized as a, a stressor. So um, I'd love to talk to you offline, but I think, I think you cannot be successful if you are emotionally drained. And that is not a good place to be. And again, there's a difference between emotional, uh, emotionally drained and physically drained because this industry is very high energy and, and requires a lot of you. And so you have to, and, and you know what? You may find that you need to pivot from that sort of position to something else because the stressors in that position just don't wire with who you are. That's okay. To, and that's that's what you're here to learn. <laughs> to suggest that you're a fully formed person at 20, 22, 24, 26, 27, 30, wherever you get out of here, depending on when you come in, it's just you're a work in progress. And, and ideally, you want to work in a progress that makes you a better person, not to destroy you. So that's, that's the issue. And that's, I appreciate you being willing to ask that question. I think it's highly relevant. So we're going to take that as our last formal question of the day. Can everybody please give a round of applause? So now, if you guys would like to talk to Margaret Bailey, please come up here. It would be yeah. informal. So. so I have my little board advisor email card right here. I have a couple of air marker shirts. Please don't take it, but if you want to look through it. I have the... Bonanelli Park RV Resort may be a great job for you because you're going to be outside all day. You might be up here. Um, <laughs> <summer> <laughs> and I, I, I feel like